Hello, welcome to today's devotion. We are in the book of Acts and looking quite intently on the second chapter, which is the giving of the Holy Spirit. And um, we're going to pick it up today with verse 22 of, of this chapter. As we go into the word, I invite you to take a moment and pray with me. We'll go into it. Father, we thank you for your, your kindness and your goodness and for your Holy Spirit that Jesus promised to give all of those who follow him, all of those who are called to be his disciples and to be one with him. It is a gift without measure in terms of the, his, his word. Without the Holy Spirit, we would never know you, nor could we know you. But as uh, various saints throughout all the last 2,000 years have attested to, it is your Holy Spirit, say in the words of Martin Luther, that calls us and gathers us and enlightens us. And so we ask for you to continue to um, do such as you have done so faithfully as we go into your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. So now we are uh, in chapter 2 of, uh, of Acts. And Peter, in verses 17 through 21, quotes Joel, the prophet Joel. I can't tell you how profound that is. I mean, there are times in which the Lord will reveal what is happening in a current situation and reveal it by way of a prophetic writing. But this particular time in which Peter was able to speak without even seeking the Lord in terms of spending time in prayer or stuff, it just came to him immediately is quite remarkable. It does happen, but this is a very remarkable instance in which the Holy Spirit gave Peter this insight, this knowledge that uh, no one else had. So there's uh, when he gets done quoting the prophet Joel, he continues then addressing his fellow Israelites with verse 22. Fellow Israelites, listen to these words. This Jesus of Nazareth was a man attested to you by God with miracles, wonders, and signs that God did among you through him, just as you yourselves know. Though he was delivered up according to God's <clears throat> determined plan and foreknowledge, you used lawless people to nail him to a cross and kill him. God raised him up, ending the pains of death because it was not possible for him to be held by death. For David says of him, and now... Peter quotes the Psalms. This is Psalm 16. I saw the Lord ever before me because he is at my right hand. I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. Moreover, my flesh will rest in hope because you will not abandon me in Hades or allow your Holy One to see decay. You have revealed the paths of life to me. You will fill me with gladness in your presence. And so now, Peter is able to quote prophetically the words of David in the Psalms. Talking about this, again, when you go to the Psalms, he, um, this is Psalm 16, I'm just going to go there for one moment. Psalm 16. Of David, protect me, God, for I take refuge in you. I said to the Lord, you are my Lord. I have nothing good besides you. As for the holy people who are in the land, they are the noble ones. All my delight is in them. The sorrows of those who take another God for themselves will multiply. I will not pour out their drink offerings of blood, and I will not speak their names with my lips. Lord, 
You are my portion and my cup of blessing. You hold my future. The boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Indeed, I have a beautiful inheritance. I will bless the Lord who counsels me even at night when my thoughts trouble me. I always let the Lord guide me. Because he is at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my whole being rejoices. My body also rests securely. For you will not abandon me to Sheol or the dead. You will not allow your faithful one to see decay. You reveal the path of life to me and your presence is abundant joy at your right hand are eternal pleasures. This is the 16th Psalm. It was given by David. David himself spoke prophetically. We think of David as a king and he certainly had that role, but he was able to speak by the gift of God's spirit prophetically. And, and in this case, going back to the book of Acts, it is Peter that recognizes this truth, recognizes this prophecy that was spoken thousands of years, a thousand, more thousand, than a thousand years before Jesus. And because of the baptism of the Holy Spirit that took place in chapter two, this immediate gift of knowledge, prophetic knowledge, is given to Peter. The Jew, Jewish people had, I can't tell you how important it was, their, their scriptures. Um, <clears throat> until, let me just back up just for a second. Until the temple was destroyed in 586 BC. The temple was the place, the central place, and the pillar of their faith. They worshiped according to the law and had daily customs, weekly customs such as the, the Sabbath. But it was their sacrificial system and the reading of the law that took place at Jerusalem that was a foundational and central part of their faith. When that was destroyed, they had no place to go. It was completely leveled. Jerusalem itself was destroyed. So that gave birth to what we know as the synagogue. Without the sacrificial, we can't sacrifice anymore. How are we going to be the people of God? And what became of the utmost importance, <clears throat> excuse me, was the scriptures. The synagogue replaced the temple. And once a week, then Jews would come to synagogue. Synagogue is uh, two Greek words that come together. Syn, S-Y-N, meaning to merge. Synthesis is, a, is a, a word that comes from that. It brings together. And the word to go, ago, means to go. So coming together or, or going together, synagogue. And at the synagogue, it was the reading of the scriptures that kept the Jewish people connected with their God, the prophets. It was because scriptures that you couldn't have a Bible in, in every, every single home. They didn't have a printing press. So each synagogue, the importance of that scripture, they would, it, would, it was very expensive as well. It would be read. It would be kept there. It was it became a supplement, or not even a supplement, a replacement for the temple. Which is in part why the Jews knew scripture so well. The same is true with regards to Christians. We think of church mainly in our country, and because of our history, as being primarily focused on location in temples and buildings. But it is the word of God that is the foundation for any community, not the building. If the building gets destroyed, we still stand on the word. When you're in the hospital or if you are homebound and you can't get to the church, it is still the word that's the foundation, which is important to understand because Peter then 
is quoting the Jewish scriptures, the word, and saying, this has now been fulfilled. This is not something new with regards to being foreign. It is new in regards to being a fulfillment of what the scriptures, although they could not necessarily see them in terms of their hidden meaning, leading in that direction, but the scriptures were always pointing towards the Messiah. And this is what Pete, this is why when Peter quotes scripture, it's not just to show off how much he knows. It's because all of the Jews were bound together through the book. It was the book that brought them together when they couldn't sacrifice any longer. I just say that because it's always been true. It, the, the word of God has always been the focal point. Jesus even uses the parable of saying, let me tell you about what it's like for someone to hear my words and put them into practice. It's like a man who, who dug down, was going to build a building, and he dug down until he found rock. And upon that kind of a foundation, he built his building. And once the building was built, even though there were storms and wind and so forth that came and beat against that building, it did not fall because it was founded and built upon a rock, a sure foundation that could not change. This word is just that. As Jesus says, heaven and earth will pass away, but not my words. So Peter quoting scripture is, is relating to that foundation, that foundation of who they were in God, of who God was in terms of his faithfulness and what he had promised to fulfill. And Jesus is using this, or I'm, I'm sorry, Peter is revealing the truth that the Jewish scriptures are founded on and how it's revealed in Christ is very profound. It wasn't just, oh, I know I can quote this scripture. It was a prophetic supernatural revelation that Peter is sharing. So he goes in verse 29. Brothers and sisters, I can confidently speak to you about the patriarch David, who wrote the 16th Psalm that he just quoted. He is both dead and buried, and his tomb is with us today. Since he was a prophet, he knew that God had sworn an oath to him to seat one of his descendants on his throne. Seeing what was to come, he spoke concerning the resurrection of the Messiah. And then he goes back and quotes a verse in the 16th Psalm. He was not abandoned to hell or in Hades, that's a Greek word, and his flesh did not experience decay. God has raised this Jesus. We are all witnesses of this. Therefore, since he has been exalted to the right hand of God and has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit, that's what we've been talking about in the previous devotions, he has poured out what you both see and, he, see and hear. Jesus poured it out. He, this is the baptism. For it was not David who ascended into heavens, but he himself says, the Lord declared to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. And now he quotes again, Psalm, or not again, but he quotes again the Psalms 110. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know with certainty that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. This is not a doctrine. It may become a doctrine, and it is accurate in terms of its doctrinal truth. But for Jews, it was, it defined everything. Because the Messiah would be the one that would rule not only over Israel, but over the world. All nations would eventually acknowledge that when God sent the Messiah, 
he would be the one that God himself anointed and appointed to rule the nations. Not Caesar is not in control. Jesus is. And it's such a shock to them because nobody thought that someone who was crucified would ever possibly be elevated to the state of being God's chosen Messiah. And it's not just abstract. It's real in this world. That's what we're going to get to uh, talk about next time. In the meantime, may the peace of God and the sovereignty of God give you his sense of certainty and confidence and hope and life. I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.